souls, deserters we are born. All right, I'm gonna stop right there for copyright purposes. Don't wanna get taken down over a song from the 70s. It's a windy day. I'm Judge Red. This is my court, Judge Red's General District Court. I'm out here at Wright Field in Austin, Texas, in Barton Springs. It's over by Chewy's, if you know where that is, the one with all the like car parts attached to it. And I'm going to be uh, telling you a little Halloween tale today uh, as evidence in our session. Remember, all day I dream about sessions. It's even... They somehow put this in uh, initial form on a lot of merchandise. That's really cool. I don't know how they predicted that it was gonna be cool. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and gavel us into session. Oh, I just dropped the sound on the gavel. I've got the travel gavel going today. No, no handle. I'm gonna be taking it out at, uh, at Drum Circle a little bit after this down at uh, Zilker Park. So looking forward to that as usual. I checked it out a little bit while ago and there was just nobody there yet really. So I'll be back. Anyway, today we're gonna go, uh, we're not gonna do any shout outs. I've got those for maybe like uh, later in the week if I can find time to do an episode. I might do another episode tonight. If my Braves win the World Series, I'm going to go out and do one more episode about the greatest baseball game ever played, which was a crime. Contained a crime. It was all about a crime. A cool crime though, Nothing, nobody got hurt. No big deal. This one though, today's, it's a little bit intense. It's that's why I'm doing it on Halloween. It's a little gruesome. Little uh, it's World Series game five tonight. The Braves are up three one, so that's why I'm kind of just feeling this whole baseball like super vibe. You know, my team is in there. They're winning the damn series. We'll see. They've done worse. They've lost worse. Anyway, let's talk about uh, today's case. Uh, I'm calling uh, us to session. Um, I have no idea. Oh, let me grab my. All right. Today's defendant is a guy named Carl Mays. We'll talk about him a little later. I mean, we'll be talking about him throughout the story, but we'll get into why he's the suspect a little later. Because at first you're going to see this as a thing that just could have happened. Like stuff happens. I'm a big believer in stuff happening. Stuff does happen. Maybe not so much in this case. Mm, 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 I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It's possible. It's possible there's another answer to the question. So all you conspiracy theorists folks out there, I'm about to give you some meat. And it's, it's an old sports thing. It's about 101 years old. But I think, you know, if you want conspiracy meat, you got to look in old refrigerators. I don't think they had refrigerators back then, but you know what I mean. Ice boxes, I guess. Look in the ice box. It's always in the ice box. There's probably a lot of body parts and old ice boxes sitting in like abandoned houses. So Carl Mays, what did Carl Mays do? Well, what Carl Mays did is really something that has to be told through the, uh, the evidence, the story of a guy named Ray Chapman, the victim in this case. Ray Chapman was um, a baseball player, obviously. He played for uh, the Cleveland, what we would call the Cleveland Indians now, same team, different name back in those days. They were called the Cleveland Naps. They were called the Naps after a guy named Napoleon Lejoie. Le 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 Joie? It looks like Le Joie, but it's Le, Le, Le Joie. It's like a French name, obviously. And he was one of the best hitters in baseball history. He was a baller hitter, had these really weird looking Spock eyes, but he was a devious hitter and runner and um, was dominant in the early part of the 20th century as a player. And he was so good that when he played in Cleveland, they were like, we want to name this team after him. Because back in those days, teams really didn't have names. They just like, wing, they would wing it based on what the press would call them or the local fans would call them. So he, um, they were just called the Cleveland Naps. Well, 
you know, we call them the Indians today. Whatever. Or no, no, they renamed themselves. What was it to again? The uh, They're named after those statues on that bridge. The Guardians, I think. That's cool. I'm going to rate it that. That old logo was so stupid anyway. That cartoon Indian. Like, come on, man. <laughs> like, when I was five, that was cool. So he was Ty Cobb's friend. That was pretty rare. Ty Cobb didn't have what you'd call a lot of friends. And as such, Ty Cobb was fiercely loyal to Ray Chapman. Ray Chapman was a um, real, uh, real button-down, dress right dress, live life the way it's supposed to be lived, do everything right, have a family and two and a half kids kind of guy. He was a bunter. He was a great uh, bunter. He was known as a, uh, he, I think he has, uh, he's on the list of the top sacrificers in, in Major League Baseball history, which is an interesting list to be on. Those guys don't get a lot of credit for the ama amazing work they kind of do for teams in crucial moments. So, uh, yeah, he was a conduct Kentucky boy, great monster, like I said. Carl Mays was a pitch was the pitcher. Ch Chapman was the hitter. Carl Mays was a submariner pitcher, one of those guys who looks like he's about to throw underhanded, but then he comes back and apparently basically throws it sidearm. But it's really basically overhand. In Major League Baseball, you can really over throw overhand only throw overhand by the rules. So submariners essentially are going low to come back high. And that's you know, that was a common thing back then. It, deceives the batter's viewpoint on where the release of the ball is going to happen, and that can cause confusion throughout the rest of the travel of the ball. So he was also a spitball pitcher, like every other pitcher back in those days. Spitballs being, um, I had a list here of what a spitball consists of. Spitballs in those days could be any lubrication of the ball, but they also tried to make the ball dirtier. That was one of the main things they did with the spitball. So these guys would spit their dirty chewing tobacco out of their mouths onto the ball. Ugh. And then other players would willfully touch the ball the rest of the game. Like, imagine that happening today in COVID times. And licorice was a big one. Uh, sandpaper was used to, to make the balls rougher. Uh, they were scarred in other ways. They were spiked, they were cut. They, were, they would rub them with soil. So they would make them darker, rougher, and in some cases, slicker. And all of these things gave the, the pitcher an advantage in delivering a ball with more spin or with more what they call movement, where the ball appears to be going different places than the batter's swinging his freaking bat and it humiliates him. So that was Carl Mays' game. Just like many pitchers back then, it was a very common thing for guys to do that stuff, and it was not considered a big deal. In the strictest sense. I mean, some guys were saying it was dangerous, but how dangerous? Eh, until, to the, until the day of today's story. So, the game was on August 16th, 1920. And in August of 1920, the Black Sox scandal was reaching its fruition. The, the series that they had stolen, or, or sorry, had thrown, for a better term, was the season before. And they were being investigated throughout the 1920 season. Kennesaw Landis was appointed to be the um, commissioner of baseball, and he kicked all those guys out approximately in September of 1920. So that plays a little bit into this story because of what happened to the Cleveland Broncos after that. If the White Sox hadn't like uh, lost basically their eight best players, or well, some of their best players anyway, it, to this scandal, they may have held on to win the pennant. So yeah, Carl Mays. This game uh, on 8-16 was uh, in its late afternoon, was, was getting into the late afternoon. So as you can imagine, we're talking about a ball that was pitch brown. They weren't replacing balls in the games back then like they do now. Like if the bat even makes contact with the ball now, they replace the ball. If the ball makes contact with the dirt, they replace it. They don't leave any scuffing on it. 
they replace sometimes hundreds of, well, dozens of balls a game. Hundreds is probably a little bit of overkill. So in the late afternoon, a ball would look pretty much, I don't know, it would look very dark. You may not even see it. So that's important. Chris Speaker was in the on base, on deck circle. He was a Hall of Fame hitter, fairly famous. Now, if you're not following the story after Nags, you don't know the names or you just don't care about baseball, I'll give you one name that was in the game watching from right field that you'll recognize, even if you're a communist from freaking Siberia. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was playing for the Yankees. That was the, sorry, I may not have mentioned the, the, the Broncos were playing the New York, New York Yankees that, that day. It was Babe Ruth's first year with the team when he was breaking out and becoming a superstar, hitting all those home runs for you know, the first time, thrilling the fans. Over 50 home runs, amazing. Watch him from right field. And um, it was just like any other pitch. He set up the throw, Chap uh, Carl May set up the throw and he delivered the pitch with his normal motion. Chapman did not react. He did not see the pitch. He didn't see it. It's reasonable to say he didn't see it. There's a lot of, he may not have seen it. He may not, he may not have seen it. Well, he's, he didn't see it. He didn't react. The ball came in high and tight, meaning it came in towards his head. They didn't have batting helmets in those days. They didn't have any kind of sports helmets. Even at football, guys, I think, pretty much played without helmets in the 20s, especially in 1920 itself, like the beginning of that decade. Warning, explicit content upcoming. The sound of the ball striking his skull sounded like a ball hitting a baseball bat. So we've heard, we've all heard that before. Not something you want to, uh, not a sound you want coming from your body. Hmm my body man it's my body don't touch my body so Carl Mays thought that the ball had been hit because Ray Chapman you know pretty decent hitter he fielded the ball and threw it to first expecting to get the out Ray Chapman knew he was hit apparently because he fell down immediately and then got back up what was described like in yo-yo form like just popped back up and then started towards first, and then, boom, went down again before he got to first. Umpire, umpire Tommy Connolly started screaming for a doctor. Doctor, doctor. In the stands, wherever. Chris Speaker rushed to Chapman, along with other players and individuals in the vicinity to assist him. They got him up. They got him up. He was walking. They let him off the field. And he was mumbling something about Katie's ring. And his wife, he had just married that year. His wife was named Kathleen. She was pregnant. He fell unconscious after the game. He was taken to St. Lawrence Hospital. That was near the Polo Grounds. That's where this game happened. The Polo Grounds was the uh, stadium that the Yankees played in back then, and it was, all, it was the home of the New York Giants. And the Yankees didn't have Yankee Stadium at that point, so they had to play where the Giants played and essentially rent it from them. In fact, that's exactly what they did. That's why, one of the big reasons why Yankee Stadium opened was to get them out of that situation. So yeah, he died at 4.40 a.m. on August 17th, uh, 1920. Survived by his wife and his unborn child and his other family members, of course, but that was the important. The Broncos played with black armbands the rest of the season. The Chicago White Sox got their players banned and dumped, tanked, whatever you want to call it, the month of September. 
the Broncos made a miracle comeback and played against the Dodgers in the World Series. They, they wore black armbands the rest of the way. That's kind of a baseball tradition for, you know, when a manager or somebody dies that's important to the team. And they won the World Series the first time it was won in Cleveland, and I think... Uh, I'm having a hard time thinking of when they won another World Series after that, so if they did, I can't remember. I'm not sure... I'm not sure they actually did. Huh, well, it doesn't matter. Kennesaw Mountain Landis uh, was a real hard ass, and he played a big part in... Um, getting rule changes made, a variety of other factors, you know, newspaper critiques and, and op-ed pieces, and just general public disgust with guys gruesomely dying on the baseball field. You know, just, to, just think of that baseball bat sound, and that's the sound of a ball hitting a guy's head and killing him, essentially. The spitball was banned. I mean, guys still use the spitball but they're cheating Gaylord Perry got in the Hall of Fame with it pitching in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and he was a cheater balls began to get replaced at the slightest sign of wear but they still didn't have batting helmets until the 1950s as a practical invention and they were not really ruled as a necessity until the late 60s or the early 70s and even then guys were allowed to grandfather and not wear a helmet if they didn't want to until they retired. So there were guys still not wearing batting helmets, I think, in the 80s, or at least one or two guys. But that's real macho. What a way to die. 99 ways to die. That's one of them. But eventually helmets were mandated in baseball. And, you know, it's funny. It took till Tony Conigliero in the 60s. So you got to ask yourself, why is this a court matter? The hell does this have to do with uh, what does this have to do with court crime and shit like that? Allow me to adjust myself for a second. Carl Mays is the problem here, conspiracy theorists. Carl Mays. Surly, a loner. Because of his father's death at a young age. Never pitched on Sunday because he was hardcore religious. Like a lot of guys back then were. And he took after his idol, Christy Matthewson, the Hall of Fame pitcher who also did not pitch on Sundays. You don't see a lot of not playing on Sunday anymore. I don't think there's anybody that does that anymore. Be kind of hard to justify. He uh, was a leader in his time in hitting batsmen. Every season, he was in the top player pitchers for hitting guys with pitches. He was known as a headhunter, which is a pretty serious accusation in baseball even back then. It means that he was a guy deliberately gunning for other players' heads when he was pitching. And that's a real bad thing, real serious. Not a guy you want playing for you or against you. It's not like hockey where you have an enforcer. This guy is dangerous. I mean as you found out here. I believe it was the only fatality in baseball history. There have been, there was another fatality, I think related to a baseball game where a guy ran through a fence. I'm not sure about that one. I think I may have, that, that might be apocryphal. Uh, but that wasn't a crime, so it doesn't matter. This one, you have to ask yourself, if he was a headhunter and he knew he was throwing balls that were probably traveling in the, the 90s miles an hour when you do something that you know could kill somebody and you do it deliberately and recklessly and you're throwing these spitballs and the ball slips and the guy doesn't see it because it's too dark and hits him in the head, are you guilty of manslaughter? Some would say yes. In 1915, uh, Carl Mace had an incident with Ty Cobb. This might be part of the reason Ty Cobb hated him so much and was so vociferous about him being getting what he had coming. Um, he threw at Ty Cobb. They had a big, bad brawl. It was what it was. And Ty Cobb never let that shit go. Ty Cobb never let anything go. Back in those days, uh, Carl Mays was pitching for the Red Sox. He was a teammate of Babe Ruth in those days as well. 
he was a World War I veteran in the sense that he was drafted or he enlisted and he trained, but he never saw any action. He expressed regret about the incident as a Christian, which, you know, okay. But he did not express any guilt. Ty Cobb, for what it's worth, said that someone should uh, get revenge on him. <laughs> like, I think he pretty much put it in exactly those terms. Someone should give him a dose of his own medicine. Yikes. <laughs> uh, I mean, decency uh, was the same then it is as, as it is now. The thing that really gets me about Carl Mays is that there were whispers that he threw games. Maybe a little more than whispers. There were whispers about a lot of game guys back then. There were more than whispers about Ty Cobb. He was straight up accused of it and was even banned briefly because of throwing a game. But with Carl Mays, as far as I can tell from my personal research, and I, unlike a Republican uh, voter, I actually went out to libraries and researched this with like documents and stuff. Um, I can't find any evidence that he threw games and knew about it, like deliberately. There's always the theory that a guy goes out half-assed, drunk or, or hung over from the night before and throws the game because he knows he can't play, but I don't have any evidence of that. I don't have any evidence that he deliberately threw the pitch to hurt somebody. I don't have evidence of anything except that he was doing his job the way that it was allowed to be done in 1920. and a horrible accident happened. The Polo Grounds was uh, located north of where Central Park is now, like just north of it. I'd imagine Central Park was there back then too, I don't know. Yeah, of course it was, right? So it's time for adjudication in this. And uh, I mean, I don't see any clear evidence that Carl Mays knew that he was going to kill Ray Chapman. I don't see any evidence that anybody did anything deliberate. I don't see any evidence that it was recklessness beyond what can be expected at any sporting event. When players enter onto the field without a freaking helmet on, they take a certain risk that they know they're taking. So I'm going to find uh, Carl Mays not guilty. And uh, if I come back at you later tonight, we're going to talk about a guy named Doc Ellis. Ooh boy, this guy's quite a character. He just died a few years ago, and uh, his story is really something else, man. <laughs> like, totally groovy, man. So it's Halloween, it's World Series, it's October. Oh, it's Drum Circle. I'm going to go hit the Drum Circle now. I might walk up to uh, 6th Street, 36th tonight, and check out the crowd. Like I said, if the Braves win tonight, I'll probably shoot a video about my boy Doc on the way there. If not, I'm going to get to it a little later in the week, uh, hopefully before the series ends. You know the old red. For now, uh, you know, I got that motto. What's that motto? Oh, yeah. You know, Ray Chapman, Carl Mays, Babe Ruth, Tommy Connolly, everybody. They're all important. We're all important. Thank you. Court. Oh, 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 oh. Camera move. Camera move. Camera move. Camera move. Camera move. Court <laughs> is adjourned. Uh.